good, nearly good afternoon. It's, I know it's a bit difficult to be between you and lunch, so bear with me a second. So the idea of this, I'm going to be talking about uh, how to produce a number of programs that take advantage of patterns and by using basically the new uh, architectures. Okay. So the idea of this talk is to provide a bit of background on the whole horizon of multi-cores, what the programmers have been doing on, on patterns, and also on what a pattern is, what a skeleton is, and then talk about the project itself, part of race. So a bit of background. Unless you have been away in a desert island for the past five years, if you have attended any conference on programming, on computing, the first thing they will show you, and that's why I didn't want to be behind, it's multi-core. And everyone says it's, it's difficult. We have, we have been increasing the different architectures, and we are changing the way we are doing things. And the reason it's it is really complicated. It's changing the way we have been doing parallel computing for the past number of years. I've been doing this, HPC, for longer than I want to admit, but certainly for the past 20 years, we've been trying to do that. And the reason is there is a, an inherent challenge in doing that. Uh, this is, there are two quotes, one from an Intel uh, engineer, Anwar, he says that people should be talking about tens, hundreds, and thousands of cores now. So if you are actually developing today, you should be thinking about hundreds of cores and possibly thousands of cores. I mean, any device or computer that you get today, it's multi-core. That's a fact of life. Even I, I've got an 11-year-old. And uh, she always ch uh, challenged me to say, but that's multi-core, right? And I said, I really don't know. It's just a mobile phone, right? And I said, but it has to be multi-core. Otherwise, it's not cool anymore. So it's teenagers. It's not someone who has been there. So children today are actually being born to multi-core computers, devices. And pretty much when we talk about this, it's computers and things that need to be thought and programmed in that way. And the important part is, of course, in an Erlang event is that we are talking about mission critical applications that they want to run in hundreds of cores. So today, if you go and try to cash a check or make a deposit, chances are that the back end, and I'm pardon my French, is going to run in COBOL. Whether we want it to run in Erlang and we can do, it's a different part. Your mobile phone is going to be in a switch, which chances are it's going to have nice Erlang solutions and that. But your check, when you go to the bank and when you do the next transaction, it's going to be running in COBOL and probably in a mainframe, OK, with MPS. So, the next wave of mission critical applications need to be taken into account multi-cores because nowadays that's the biggest challenge for real developers. Okay? So what can we do? The real issue here is when we talk about multi-cores, people thought it was something that it was already addressed. And the reason being is in the late 80s and in the early 90s, most of, of parallel programmers were dealing with machines that had multiple processors. So if you have a processor with multiple cores, it was simple to assume that it was like multiple computers with a single processor. But guess what? It's not the same. The best analogy I can think of was given to me by a friend of mine, Shaheen Khan, at Sun Microsystems, 
And he said, you can think of having two people, having two individuals, or having twins joined by the brain. So when you have multi-core computers, they do share resources that are not able to be partitioned, okay? So if you have four cores, but they happen to share parts of the cache, parts of the memory access, it's like having twins joined by the brain. You cannot take them away. So talking about programming in multi-cores, you can model probably with two, even with eight cores. But nowadays, if you go to Fry's here in the Bay Area, you can get a, a server certainly with eight cores. I mean, any computer, fairly decent, will have processors with up to eight cores. Certainly the new ones from AMD, the Opterons have 12 cores. If you are into high performance computing, this XE6 has 24 cores, okay, AMDs. So trying to do that, it's going to be really difficult. Sequ modify sequential work, modify sequential code may work, but the reality is that most people are, what are doing are just putting multiple programs and take advantage of concurrency but larger systems are more challenging. So we think that if we change the way we conceive applications, that's gonna change. And the idea is, we call it to think in parallel, but we, we are not the only ones. There are many people doing this, but the idea is to have high level parallel constructs. And talking to an audience of Erlang programmers and developers, this is great because you guys are people who have been doing this for a number of years. You know that there is an important part in deploying applications that can decouple the computation from the coordination. Because if you talk to traditional or typical parallel programmers, the idea is that you have people who are application programmers, but also systems programmers. They have to know about the application, but also about the architecture they are deploying on. And there is no option in having to abstract that. It's almost impossible to scale unless the problem is simple. And even more, it's very difficult to change the fundamentals of the parallel application. Typically scheduling, task structure, and migration. Things that you take for granted when you are talking about Erlang. But even more, you talk about libraries, but not abstractions. And clearly, just to make it even darker, you will see within the next five years what it's called highly heterogeneous or dark silicon processors. If you buy, again, a $300 computer from Fry's today, if it's got one of the top Intel processors, the actual processor works, the cores, the dual core, they work at 2.8 gigahertz, and there is a turbo mode at 3.3, which is only switched on when you're using both cores at the top of performance. You would say, oh, that's very green, and in Europe, everyone feels great, and we're saving the planet. But there is even that more important part. If they work both at the top of the speed, your computer switches off itself in about half an hour, because you can fry eggs on that processor. Okay? And that's going to happen. I mean, there will be processors in the future that it, they call it dark silicon. They will have many functional units, but it will be impossible to turn them on at once. The reason being, the processor itself will need to dissipate so much heat that it cannot be done. And you will have things like 
CPUs, which that's the way we all think, but now we have GPUs. Okay, your graphics cards are now being used with hundreds of cores to compute really tough problems, floating point problems. But guess what? Again, people thought that it's, it's again CPUs. Try that. If you have tried GPU programming, there is actually a, a trend on trying Erlang with GPUs. And uh, believe me, just transferring from the memory in the CPU to the GPU takes, takes some time. Then you have APUs. Uh, in fact, a couple of uh, processor manufacturers, namely ARM, has developed this APU, which is a CPU with a GPU on the same, soft cores, FPGAs, you name it. So you have hundreds of lightweight scalar FPGA units and tens of specialized units. So everything seems to be in terms of the hardware, but in terms of the actual programming, you will have to have a way of programming even within the chip. So in the best case, it's gonna be something like NUMA, non-uniform memory access. It's impossible that you have different parts of uh, the processor and still assume that they will communicate seamlessly. That's not gonna happen. You may even have message passing on a chip. So for programming, you will have heterogeneous systems in an integrated way. That's what we want to have. It's gonna be impossible basically to program each kind of core differently. Today you have to think if it's a CPU, a GPU, an APU, how you transfer from memory back and forth. There isn't a single way of actually programming both without having to consider the architectures. And another thing that it's very important is that it's impossible to make pure static decisions. Today you said, I have compiled my program, it's been optimized, and I can run it. When you talk about these sort of processors and these sort of architectures with multiple cores and units, there is going to have some kind of dynamic assumptions. So with all this in mind, what we are going to be looking at is at pattern-based approaches. So the idea is, instead of using the traditional coordination approaches, read Linda here, or parallel stream-based approaches, typical DSPs, or yet devising an, an, another programming language, parallel Haskell, parallel Fortran, parallel C. I remember when I was doing my PhD at some point, after being in industry for a while, I thought, let's try to find out how many parallel programming languages are there. I think I stopped the count at 100. It was a very interesting example of how many you can do. So getting more into this, it's we try to work on parallel patterns and skeletons. The idea is a pattern, you probably are familiar with the concept, it's basically a name plus the problem it can be solved plus an implementation strategy. There is a very famous book, The Gang of Four. It's, it's there, it's one of the best sellers in, in parallel well, in programming in general, in structured programming. And basically a pattern in general is used for design. A parallel pattern by extension is that, it's used for design. And the typical examples of a parallel pattern is to represent embarrassingly parallel computations, stage computations, and a, a complement to that is a skeleton, an algorithmic skeleton. It's a programming construct to implement a particular pattern. So in that respect, the algorithmic skeleton plus the design features makes a pattern, and the examples to that is a farm, which can be used to implement parallel computations, embarrassing parallel computation, a pipeline, which is used for state lines. 
a bit more on, on the skeletons. The skeletons are higher order functions. Basically, they were conceived in the late 80s by Marie Cole. There is a book from MIT Press, the reference is at the bottom. And the idea is these skeletons abstract and implement patterns of parallel computation, communication, and interaction. If you have seen non-skeletal based parallel programs, the real issue is that you have primitives of the actual computation, and then within the same program, you have primitives to implement communication. So the idea is by using skeletons, you decouple that. You just, the application programmer is just concerned about computation, what it's also known as the behavior, what it's trying to do, and the underneath al algorithmic skeleton framework does all the structure. Typical examples of this is data parallel. You may be familiar with scan, map, reduce. If you put, of course, map and reduce together, you will have the, map re the famous map reduce part. But certainly all of this, for some of you who have been uh, working with other languages, can be extended from Lisp. So Lisp in a way uses all of those skeletons or, or skeletal operations on lists. In terms of task parallel, there are a number of farm, pipeline, reduce, and others. So they work on tasks at a higher level. And you have skeletons for resolutions of problems, divide and conquer, branch and bound, dynamic programming, heuristic optimizations. But of course, uh, talking about farms to Erlang programmers is like trying to teach my grandmother to suck eggs. You do that for a living. I mean, here you have supervisors and workers, and that's the way you conceive things. There is no other way. I mean, it's if you actually talk to other people, is, is there a way to actually do a supervise or work, but here it's, that's the only way. You actually conceive applications that, that part. So what am I uh, trying to extend? So the idea is not to reinvent the wheel. And that's why I'm gonna uh, explain more about the project. That's why in this project we requested from the European Commission 3.5 million euros to actually work on something that has an impact. And one of our partners in that project is Erlang Solutions. So it's actually getting something not only conceived by academics in an ivory tower, but also to have a real industrial impact. And that's what the ideas that we are want to do. It's, of course, this is not Erlang, this is Haskell, and I apologize for that, but it's, this is the, Algorithmic skeletons, you have parallel maps or parallel zip width or reduce. That sort of idea of getting the skeletons and getting as that resolution patterns to do on orbit calculation or duplicate elimination, chain reduction, partition backtracking. So a number of problems that can already be solved, but that you don't have to specify how to solve it. Just describe the problem. So that leads me exactly to the project, to what I'm talking here. So we went last year uh, to the European Commission. We put together a proposal for a three-year research project. It's been running since October last year, and we'll be running this program until the 30th of September 2014. It's funded by the European Commission, as I was saying. We have nine partners. The, all of them are in Europe. Yes, you, Israel is in Europe for the purposes of the European Commission. Uh, in fact, the company that is in Israel is Melanox Solution. Melanox Solutions, Melanox, has a, the headquarters are here in Silicon Valley, but the R&D branch is in Israel. So we have uh, two universities from the 
UK, three actually, uh, Queen's University, RGU, and St. Andrews. We have Erlang Solutions, a couple of universities in Italy, Pisa and Torino. Austria, we have a network of companies. In Germany, we have one of the biggest supercomputer centers in Europe, HLRS, the supercomputing center in Stuttgart. And clearly, as I was saying, we have Erlang Solutions. What it's, what's the idea of what we're gonna be doing in the project? It's conceiving an application here from design, get it parallel, and once you have these parallelized applications, getting dynamically mapped into CPUs or GPUs. The idea to do that is to help us to think in parallel by using patterns. So you cannot use paraphrase without using patterns. You have to use, you are forced as a programmer to use that. It's gonna be an open source program. Uh, everything that we generate from here, it's going to be released as open source. We're going to use cost-directed refactoring, meaning we will rewrite source to choose the best pattern. So possibly the application programmers have decided that a pipeline can do. But once the pipeline has been laid down, it happens to be a pipeline, but in, indeed a farm in one of the stages can be mapped in a way that it will improve performance. We will use virtualized components, and I will try to uh, elaborate a bit more on that in hardware and software, and we will use two standardized platforms, C and C++ and Erlang. No, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. For H for HPC in particular, we have a number of users that they want to use and they have applications today running in Fortran. We have uh, SCCH is running uh, the weather centers in, in Austria. So they are, they are trying to deploy that application. And what we intend to do is, after all, the Fortran components can be extended by using a wrapper and by using just a wrapper as part of that, you can actually put it as a C part, so it's generating load, or you can just extend it in another part. So in particular, it's not Fortran, but we are going to be using C++, C++ on Erlang. And the code can be in, internally a, a Fortran component. So again, I use that part to Develop. So the idea of what we're gonna change is by using this parallel pattern with a couple of the CPUs from the GPUs and map at runtime. What it actually means is we annotate the parallel pattern and we map and remap the tasks to a virtual hardware. And it was great that Costis gave a talk before me because that idea of the LLVM using an intermediate code that can be statically annotated, it's exactly the idea that it's been trying to exploit here. The idea of you have a single source code, but you can have an intermediate representation, and again, apologies because this is a generic one, and I know that the Erlang people are familiar with that part and with that inter intermediate representation, but not every platform does that. Clearly Fortran or C or the others are always used to generate for that part, so for the, for the actual platform. So by using this idea of virtualizing the hardware, we can think of this. So we have the pattern, the pattern can be refactored, that's why the different shape, change in the actual pattern, but the actual 
uh, functionality is the same. You have that implemented into a software virtualization layer, meaning a number of processes that can have different interactions. And those interactions are then dynamically map and remap into a heterogeneous platform. So there, are, there might be components that are more suitable for CPUs, and there are components that might be su more suitable for GPUs. In, again, in the examples from Costis, it was clear that some of his examples, the quick sort, I mean, without having much to think about, it was for a CPU. I mean, comparing is highly scalar, so we knew it was from a CPU without even uh, looking at the code. And clearly, Mandelbrot, you don't have to be a genius to know that it's embarrassingly parallel. You can use a GPU and potentially a pattern that can uh, use a farm or something similar. But that has to be, today, mapped and done by the programmer. If you were to use patterns that could be dynamically mapped, potentially refactored, and then done here. And ultimately, the idea is to have this, to have a compiler, okay, which actually can have a number of objects, then a mapping, that mapping have an object which can be uh, deployed into a hardware platform. You keep monitoring what is going on and have some kind of dynamic adaptation and back to the hardware platform. Once you have that part of that adaptation, you keep some performance aggregation and by using some analysis, you go back to the adaptation. So there is a quick decision the first time, and then you keep improving it as you learn how different codes behave. So it's the whole feedback loop. Of course, you cannot run Markov models online, but you can keep them on the back of the back end of your framework, and you just keep storing how good you are doing. And the ultimate objective is, of course, integrate the computational problems and their parallel patterns to improve the overall resource utilization. So going from real problems, discovering the patterns in the problems, transferring that into code, which is deployed in different architectures. The long-term impact, we. We want to believe that it's going to change the way people develop. It's going to be accelerated. It's going to improve by using dynamic mapping code to resources without the functional properties, help to virtualize and abstract the coordination, potentially improve speed to market, think in parallel, think and design in parallel, and use low effort. And this is the last slide. You will be happy to know that because it apparently launch is going to be served soon. And the idea is, first of all, why patterns? It's because you have a number of them that have been studied for a while. They can be standard. They can be domain specific. They can be designed for heterogeneity. Clearly, this is a a trend today, even the Economist run a special article saying that it's not going to be just imperative when it comes to parallel programming. So it was very interesting to see that actually the Economist could spell well functional programming, and it was it was a very important because it actually changed the way many people thought about it. If you go into uh, and talk to scientists and people who are using supercomputers, they will say, well, well, whatever you want to do, but as long as it runs in Fortran, right? Birth in the 90s, he was interviewed by the IEEE computer, and they asked him, what is the 
the language of the future? And he replied, in particular for scientific computing, I really don't know how it will look like, but it will be called Fortran. And that's a, that's a fact of, I mean, you have to make sure, and I'm grateful for the question, it's in terms of big computers, it, you actually have to, to think about how to accommodate a number of, of applications. So the idea is potentially to have this targetless programming using new virtualization mechanisms, abstract memory access, communications and the states, using monitoring information. We don't know. We think that it's just execution time, memory and power, but there can be more historical versus predicted information. So you take a decision and then you keep on improving. And of course, how much static and how much dynamic mapping you need to take. Okay, so I'd like to thank you very much for your, for your attention. If you want to know more about this project, it's in paraphrase-ict.eu. We have a small Twitter feed going on there at paraphrase underscore FP7. And I will be happy to entertain any questions you may have at this point. Thank you. Yeah. There are many, you can say I have a solution for HPC, mm -hmm. for example, I have technical computing, number crunching, uh, high performance embedded computing, yep. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you can design a solution, generic solution for every possible field. So what is your target field? It's, uh, it's a good point. We have, through ACCH, the Software Competence Center, Hangenberg, we are getting a number of representative HPC applications. Those representative applications, I mentioned weather forecasting, so they have a number of weather stations that are uh, going to be using. That's, uh, as, as you pointed out, it's for embedded HPC type. We have DSP, actually, as well. So digital signal processing, they are going to provide another one. They are going to provide another one for neuroscience. Uh, in particular for neural network processing. And, but in this case, rather than the actual application that you look first, the idea is looking at common patterns of interaction. Example being, you have, there is a book that it's called Parallel Computing Works. It's probably 18 years old. It's this, or by Messina, Paul Messina. And it's got probably, 20 to 30 different applications that all share embarrassingly parallel behavior. So the whole idea, it's probably not looking purely at the application, but at common patterns for embarrassingly parallel behavior. I can think of Mandelbrot, image processing, and I can keep on going on. They all have embarrassingly parallel behavior, meaning no matter what you do, they don't share anything they have different sources of information and they write in different parts. So pretty much everyone is happy and you can schedule anywhere, but they, you have to minimize communication. There are a number that, that have the pipeline. Again, you can have uh, linear algebra applications or DSPs. So we are not looking at application specific domains. We're looking at we can at pattern specific domains so that multiple applications that share that. And we are pretty much interested in solving that in terms of task farms, pipelines, uh, data parallel and stream. So that's what we are looking. And you're right in terms of, it's not a size fits all, but certainly it's a, hopefully a pattern fits all. Yeah, actually, uh, yes, I, I'm familiar with OpenCL, and certainly we're looking at OpenCL as a possible uh, language for the deployment of that. The coordination in particular can be done, uh, we're using something called FastFlow, 
Um, by using FastFlow to coordinate the skeletons, OpenCL can be the deployment vehicle. But of course, there is always the debate between OpenCL or CUDA. And we are, look, uh, if you ask to NVIDIA, they will say CUDA, of course. If you talk to Kronos and the rest, they will say OpenCL. We've been running some benchmarks and mixed results, but still CUDA, uh, CUDA is faster, more difficult. OpenCL, it's more homogeneous and deployable but there, might, there is a performance trade-off, yes. So that's what we are looking at. Um, another question, from the point of view of developer, yep. I don't understand if I still need to write source code or I just have some time to group or DSL to configure the pattern. You have to, you have to still, uh, I'm gonna probably uh, go on. Uh, collection of components. Exactly, you have a collection. I'm going back to this one. So basically you will have similar standard uh, interface Erlang type of components. You have calls to those components and those components will, by just parameterizing those components, you will have the, the advantage of using the pattern. And in terms of proof of concept. Exactly the same, there are APIs in a library. It's just, it's just like library and source code. Exactly, it's a library, it's an API and it's open source. 